much easier to make the connection, you know, if you travel through Bulgaria, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, then you really see, you know, what's in between. And basically, my picture for what's in between is that if you come from Germany to Pakistan, actually you have to climb over a very high mountain. You know, it's like more than the Himalayas, <coughs> and this mountain is the mountain of prejudice and misinformation, which is spread right there, and it's really, yeah, really have to make an effort. You know, so, so my view of that is, I'm climbing over that mountain, I'm a young, innocent guy, I don't have any previous information, except what I learned in school about Islam, which was basically, let's use a plain word, bullshit. And so I'm coming here, I'm looking over, you know, and what I'm spotting is, I look into Seban Sharif. So for a young guy, who has not seen anything like that, let's also say maybe he's a hippie. He's coming to that place and he feels that he's transported to a fairy tale. You know, suddenly he's in the fairy tale of storytellers and musicians and balangs and fakirs and so on. And so, as he said, it's a music, it's much more than the music, you know. It's not just the music, it's the colors, it's the, the you know, the whole environment. But also, if you get closer to fakirs and malams, like I, I did, you know, I was kind of adopted by an old fakir, and I was sort of the time I spent there, I got some kind of initiation in the tamiz of the fakirs, you know, how you, how you behave, what you say, what you don't say. Yeah, and, and what was this tamiz that they told you? It's a known thing, and actually, uh, I, I think I told you before I'm writing a novel, to, uh, to go into that, uh, but here, what we have here is really, originally it was like a coffee table presentation, more bigger format, and uh, it's, uh, everything is done in 97, and I, at the time I could bring about 50 musicians from Pakistan to Berlin, many of them for the first time, and then uh, the book actually was intended to give the German readers some insight into something which they had never heard about before, which is that Sufi culture of the Indus Valley. So that was the aim. And when uh, Amina Saeed came up with the idea to uh, have the book uh, printed also in Pakistan, my reaction to that was that uh, I should make a new book because in the 15 years since 97, you know, so many things have changed. I'm actually very, very glad that you didn't, because it, as I said earlier, it documents something that uh, that needed to. I mean, that's what people said, but but you see, quite a few of these shrines you see in the book have been bombed. Yeah. Some of them have been torn down and reconstructed in a outrageous way, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, really looking like Saudi airports, you know, rather than shrines. You know. And uh, so, and also many of the people have died. And uh, so uh, then my Pakistani friend said, no, you should have the book here as it was because uh, uh, many of us haven't seen that what you have seen at the time. <coughs> so it's here, but there is a preface, which I think is important, which goes under the title, where have all the Sufis gone? Because my question really is a book presenting it now to Pakistani readership and audience is where have all the Sufis gone? You know, what happened to all these people? Where are they? What are they doing? And what's happening in all these uh, shrines, you know? And what do you think about what's going on today? And what could be done or could not be done? So that's like a deep, that's also some kind of challenge which I want, which I'm raising with the book, but otherwise it's not a, 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 a academic writing at all, you know, because academic is you read all the books previously, take the notes, and then do, you go to the field for three weeks or three months, maybe, maybe three months, and then you come there and maybe you add something to that. So this is not the result of reading, it's the result of traveling and watching something, there's a wonderful fresh mind because I didn't have any preconceived uh, ideas. 
So, so I wanted to, you know, to transmit the incredible pleasure if you see something beautiful for the first time. Let's compare it to falling in love. You know, that's incomparable. You know, that's something which, you know, I mean, if you want to describe that in writing or pictures, yes, we have a lot of literature is about that. So this is like. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that I want to bring up this, uh, this pleasure. So I, uh, and the text is not intended to go come up with the research and all that. So it's actually, you know, what I would say, the, the, the start of my love affair with Pakistan. And I think it's very, it's very evident. I have to say when I, when I first uh, saw the title of your book and I thought, oh God, another ethnomusicologist writing another book called Sufi Music and uh, I was blown away more than just being pleasantly surprised by, by what this book is. It really does bring that enthusiasm. It's, a, it's an aesthetic engagement with the culture and the music which, uh, which we really just don't do enough. I tell you what I did, uh, video play was like that? Can you? No, music is not video. Uh, music? No. I just think it's your DJ and marketing. No, why don't we listen to music? Who played the music earlier? Yeah. 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 It was getting started. It was getting started. Yeah. 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 I, if I see a book with the word Sufi, yes. you know, the four letter word Sufi written on the title, I have the same feeling, my God, you know, another book on that, this term which has been so much twisted and misused and overexposed and, you know, and uh, transported into whatever real, you know, the Sufi soap and the Sufi soul and the Sufi cooking oil and the Sufi <laughs> And drinking, drinking so, water. Yeah, I'm so yes. sorry that we can't have any water. Sufi, Sufi yeah, drinking yeah. water. Laga, laga. Sufi yeah. drinking water. So, we come on with Sufi drinking water. So, the thing is, you know, I took a lot of, uh, of uh, 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 care to really avoid the word Sufi in the title. So, it's called Saints and Singers, which is an which inspiration. No. No, no, but they have the music. Let's no, no, no. They don't have the music because it's only one channel. Uh, so we can't get the music because okay. it's mixed. Let's stop it. I, I mean, it doesn't make sense to see people making, you know, lip sync. <laughs> Write the book and listen to the record and see the book. <laughs> okay, so let's sorry. read some rather talk about that. There's, there's a wonderful clip in there of, uh, of a singer on, I think he's on, on, on an ekpara. And he's holding, uh, it's, his, it's his collection of books, which is a recycled tin of Sufi cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is a wonderful singer in Tasu. In, uh, and he has, you know, like the Sufis, wandering Sufis have that uh, uh, thing. Yeah. yeah. So he used uh, the Sufi. His Kashkol is a Sufi cooking one. Sufi cooking one. And it says, uh, original Sufi, you know. <laughs> I, I, I like that. But also we had, for instance, you know, Patane Khan. Yes. You know, it was, I was in Jahoro and I was scouting around and I knew the name of Patane Khan. And so I thought that this guy must be really somehow special. So I asked people in the room, and they would say, Oh, Patana Khan is dead. And the next person said, No, he's very old, he doesn't sing anymore, he cannot sing. And then the next one said, you'll, you'll never find him, he's somewhere in the village. And I need it, you know. I went to this place called Adu, and I met him. I was, 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 Stop that petrol pump he came out, you know, with his sons. I think he has lots of sons. And he's living with them. 
So I spent a whole day with him and recorded all that. And man, what a beautiful old man. I mean, a singer who has a total accomplished life and is totally at peace with what's happening. You know, he, didn't he, he had no complaint about whatever. He was just so happy to sing for me and, and others also. Okay. And, uh, I and, think and uh, how, how was he living? I mean, I'm curious to know. He was not living poor at all. His okay. son was having a shop in the bazaar. I mean, it was like not, uh, you know, not high class or something. But he was, he had a nice courtyard with a, with a pole and he was sitting on that and playing the harmonium and singing for us. And that, I think, became his last recording because shortly after that, that he died. So I recorded Mera uh, Ishkvitu, you know, the famous song. And it's the most beautiful version of that song. So that's also in the book. So these people now are dead, so it's good to have, to, you know, to, to, to have a memory of them because as long as we uh, 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 remember them, they are not really dead, right? Tell, tell me about the title. You, you had met, started to mention it and I wanted to ask you how you came up with saints and singers. No, look, the, the thing is that, as I said, I think the word Sufi should be taken out of circulation. But well, you still have it. We'll, we'll come back to that. But let's talk about saints and singers first. Okay. Now, yeah, look, I'm a musicology, you know. I'm not an ethnomusicologist. I spent one hour in the seminar <laughs> and I decided not to do that because it's a, it's a total uh, uh, fallacy, you know, because if you look at music, you see music, if you look at ethnic things, it's a different thing. Because if you see music as ethnic, then you would say Mozart is the ethnic dance music of Vienna in yeah. the 18th century and all that stuff. So it doesn't really make sense at all. So I'm only an ethnic musicologist watcher, like some people watch birds. I, I see what they're doing in the field. and. Most of the, I mean, sometimes it's really funny. But, so, I wanted to have a different focus. So, saints and singer, singers, there are many things come up, you know, saints and singing by Gertrude Steve Stein, and also saints and singers yes, by this Philonius monk, and many things. So, it's beautiful. But in Germany, you <coughs> cannot make that title. So, uh, what I did in Germany is, that I call the book Troubadours of Allah because the troubadours are like the next equivalent to the Sufis in, in these countries. <coughs> so people, people can understand the word troubadours in Europe although they have no idea what the troubadours were all about. That's sort of, they've been killed, forgotten. Uh, the history is only written by the people who killed them. So, and there are a few songs that are surviving, but mostly only the text. Well, the troubadours have a direct connection to the Muslim mystical tradition, which I think very few people know. Uh, they were influenced by and came out of the culture of, uh, of Islamic Spain. Well, what happened, you know, I mean, there are people, uh, historians who challenge that, but uh, I, I think that what happened with the troubadours was like a direct implant, a direct cultural implant into Europe brought from North Africa yeah. and Andalus and so on. So because if, if you look at that, you know, even if the, all the troubadours were really extinguished and killed and I mean destroyed, <coughs> uh, the, 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 the rhymed uh, love poetry which you have today in pop songs, A-A-B-A, -A -A, yeah. you know that form which the stones are using, I mean, not only the stones, everybody, that's built on the model of the troubadour love songs. You know, so it survived, and other things which survived were they brought the oud, which became the lute and became the guitar, and they brought the nephi, which was becoming the trumpet, and they brought the santur, which became the piano, and so on. So all our European instruments, excluding maybe the flutes, which we find 30,000 years old in Europe. Uh, that's an implant, you know, and, and when people talk about, like, I mean, musicologists or even generally, they always say, 
oh, there is Eastern music and Western music, and it's opposed to that it says harmony and this melody. This is all total nonsense because Oriental music, the music you have here, and the music you have in India, and so on, uh, it comes from exactly the same roots and it has exactly the same tonal system. <coughs> now in Europe, that's yes, a surprising claim. So no, it's, it's yes, but I stand by it. We okay. can talk for, about it for the next 30 hours. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will not give up. I can prove it actually, but it takes a longer uh, discussion. So, so I want the, the thing was I wanted to, you know, if you bring something to people, you want to give them a clue by something which they know, so people there are no troubadours. And then the troubadours of Allah never anybody has coined this word, and so it's a surprise. But my actual title, which I really loved, was Saints and Singers. So of course I used it uh, at this time. I was asking you because of course the the reference in English, the play on Saints and Sinners, is obvious. But uh, within Muslim mystical traditions, especially <coughs> in the poetry. Uh, you have this constant uh, refrain of uh, the the mystic traveler being a sinner, and uh, and there being and there being truth and honesty in that admission of sin, and also this concept of um, somebody on the Sufi path being a sinner because he or she will go to extremes in his devotion or love for the divine um, and, and, and in terms of uh, external ritual religion will be rendered a sinner. That's very right, but, but you see, to this I have to say that you hear it say Sufi poetry mysticism in the framework of Islam. People say that and of course they are right but there are other people who say, no, what's actually behind that is, has been preceding Islam since the time of Adam and Eve, and it's something which goes on and will go on as long as uh, uh, people keep up the idea that they have not reached the final stage of perfection, which I don't think we have. We are a very young race, you know, and maybe before we kill ourselves, maybe we take another step to take it further. But that's, so if you look at the troubadours, you see, you know, I know troubadour songs from Sicily, 11th century, and the verses are almost literally the same, which my uh, friend Alan Fakir uh, Really? Can you give us an example? Uh, there is a thing, you know, me katumun na pitimun, na marbimun na titimun, as a ashika must jale, this thing. And that's like a riddle song. I'm not this, I'm not that. Same thing, 11th century Europe. So, how can you say this is only an oriental thing, you know? And if you would look for that, these ideas are not the property of any religion. So, I mean, I understand people, you know, I come across and they say, well, Sufi is a contested, uh, or how you say, I don't know, issue. And so, if you're in that framework, in that country, you talk about that, you take a lot of care to say, well, this is something Islamic to make sure people won't tell you this is not, it isn't Islamic, and it, it actually is, because it is, you know, I mean, think of all the poets and the music. But at the same time, uh, you know, Sufism is not an ideology. The word Sufism, you know, is, was coined by a German theologian, uh, Andreas Tullock, who was a missionary in 1824 in Berlin. He was the first man to use that word. And now everybody talks about Sufism, but, you know, and he made it up at the time when they made up communism and capitalism and Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. So all the isms came up. But I don't think that Sufi uh, is an ism. You know, I, don't, I don't think it's, a, it's an ideology. Yeah, I agree with it's you. not a system of thought. It's really something else. Okay. So, can I give one sentence? Uh, coming back, I'm sorry that I'm 
Okay, you must say this being in the world, you know, if you open Kashi energy, <laughs> yes. uh, you find in the very beginning, you know, the first, which we really say is people normally they like, used to trace the word Sufi to the word Su, which means cool in Arabic, yeah. and you find it everywhere. Then he says, if that would be the case, camels and goats would be Sufis much rather than human beings because they are wearing the wool. And he says the etymology, we are not happy if you understand this word. Nevertheless, any Western book you open nowadays, what is Sufism? Yes, it goes back to the word Su for wool and all that. But this has been contested by the Sufis himself nine centuries ago, you know. And then he says, Tazawuf yeah. is a view, he's quoting an older master and he says, they say that Tazawuf used to be a reality without a name and nowadays, 1175, it has become a name without a reality behind it. So the, the, the discussion, what it really is, is going on for well, more than a thousand years. But I really think the world has become so tired, let's think about something else, you know? Because if you talk and you say Sufi, everybody thinks he knows what Sufi is. Nobody knows. So, so it's not, you know, you, you come, you tell about something, and you get really the wrong but I think But I think that's okay, because it's about the kind of knowledge that you cannot know unless, until and unless you experience it. So whatever word you're going to give to it, uh, whether it's Sufism or the Sarbo for mysticism, no one will know what it means. Yeah, at the same time, it's not really, it's, it, it's not knowledge. It's, I'm not saying you should find a, a, a better word, but what I'm saying is lift your brainwash of believing that you know what Sufi means. All right, means. that's right. That, that's valid. I think we uh, we can continue the conversation about Sufism, about the choice of the word, which you did finally put in your title. Um, or maybe your publisher insisted Sometimes. that you did. Yeah, you want to identify where it is. Where it is. But um, since we weren't able to see uh, your, your, your clip, which shows you know, the highlights of where you traveled, I thought maybe you could tell our audience a little bit about, about where all you went uh, and why you've chosen uh, to, to contextualize uh, your journey in the Indus Valley. You spend right. a long time talking about the yes, Indus Valley yes. in your book as well. Okay, see, uh, how I see the Indus Valley is that I see this area and I see the river coming down from the mountains and I see people coming in here from the west, the Iranians, the Brits, although the Brits the turned around. Yeah. I came from the eastern side, but also many people coming from the eastern, then all the people coming down from Central Asia, from the north, and the Arabs and the Africans coming in from south overseas and so on. So you have, I mean, the melting pot you can imagine. I think there's no other place on earth that has this kind of mix of religions, races, people, languages. So I think that what we call Sufism was the answer which was worked out to have all these people accept each other and respect each other and overcome the idea that we have to fight against each other because I think I'm this and you're that. So that the, the Sufism was the answer to that. And so when I asked my Pakistani friends, you know, what is special about Sufism in Pakistan or in the Indus Valley? Uh, the answer I usually get is, well, we have this, all these shrines and we have this, uh, uh, these saints and we have Nusra Fadi Ali Khan and all that. But, you know, that's really not, uh, that's really not enough because, of course, let's say here, you yeah, have the maximum concentration of, of shrines. You yeah, have shrines in every third or fourth village, you know, I mean, 
nobody knows all these rights. I've never met a person who saw them all. But that's, that, so that's like the central area. But the thing is that what happened in the Indus Valley is something which is not only concerning Pakistan, but it's concerning the whole region, the whole continent, and actually more continents. So the thing is, what has been worked out here in terms of, you know, acceptance uh, of others is something which is not the property of Pakistan, but it's kind of world property. And the, the problem is that if you kill it in Pakistan, if you let these people die out, then the loss is not only a Pakistan a loss. The loss is a world of a, a, a world culture. You know, that's the thing. And, and 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 what I would say is that I mean my I mean I know it's naive, but I would say is that you know Pakistan, please come together and say that you invite all the peace loving people of the world to come here. Because in the end, the peace-loving people will outnumber the terrorist-loving people. I, I believe that. So, so I'll give you a, a little story why, I mean, how I think. Uh, you have heard about the Tuareg in, in the, yes. the Sahara Desert. So, in the Tuareg always used to have a festival where the tribes gather once a year and they have stories and sing songs and dance and so uh, by 99 or 2000, some tourists met some uh, a French band, uh, with, with, like traveling uh, musicians, and they were in Mali. So they got together and tourists said, come visit our, you know, our gathering. So the French guy said, wow, that's great, but why don't you invite all the all world music? Here and then he listened to you, he listened to us. And then what happened? So in the first year, it was 30 foreigners sitting. You know, you have, I mean, it's hard to reach. You have to go first to Timbuktu, then you drive another six hours before you reach the place where yeah. it happened. Yeah. Third year, first year, 30, next year, 300, next year, 3,000 people. So, and now we have that. Turek again are under attack, you know, and mistaken for Taliban and so on. I mean, there are many witnesses to tell you that the Turek are some of the greatest musicians around, and they love music and poetry, and they say, we don't leave the Sharia because it's the stars are in the sky, they show us the way where we have to go. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, so there is, this is like a cultural uh, transfer. So if you come to, to, to a country and you meet some musicians, the angle you get from them is, is, is so much more uh, important and evidence of what the politicians tell you or what the news tell you. So that could be a model. So actually, I mean, what the Pilsadas have been doing with the, with the festivals, that's the idea, but, but I think, especially now where Pakistan is like no tourist destination of whatsoever. Uh, before, at least people used to pass through on the way to India. We should, we now, should, we now, should have a big music festival. Uh, we should have something which is really more than a music festival. It should be really addressed, you know. I mean, make an appeal, you know. Peace loving people of the earth, music loving people of the earth, don't let yourselves get fooled by the media. We will take care of you and we will show you something beautiful. Yes, that's, so that's the idea, you know, of course, naive. Peter, tell me, uh, you told a story about Patani Khan. Are there other such, uh, any particular encounters with uh, some of the musicians you met that are, that are memorable as? as encounters with another person? You know, I mean, so many are memorable, but, but uh, Surab Fakir was a good friend of mine, and I learned songs from Alan Fakir, and I share company and many other things with these guys. And many other and, things. <laughs> and, 
Um, but something which is, I think, is really outstanding is, so I came to Bija, which I had seen before, and Bija... And was this is in 97, or 69? This was already ha happening in 97, okay. when I came back there. And whoever has been there knows that this is something really uh, very special which is going on there, in terms of poetry, also in terms of a performance, which goes from sunset to sunrise, and it's going on all the time. So that's, uh, you know, this has been reinvented in the West by uh, performance uh, artists <coughs> and called the, the Theater of Eternal Music and so on by Lamont Young, but, but actually it's already there. It, only it's not called modern art, it's something traditional, but it's, you know, it's much more refined and developed. So I thought, how can I bring that to Germany? Because this is not a showpiece you can put on the stage. Well, no, it's, it's devotion, it's prayer. <laughs> and not only that, because some forms of devotion you can do on the stage. But this is, you know, a whole night in the shrine. How can I do it? So I talked to the Purban Fakir, my friend Purban Fakir, and I explained it to him. Uh, and, and he said, let's recreate Shalatif. <coughs> uh, it's not only the Fakirs we bring Shalatif to Germany. So what we did is to make a video installation <coughs> in the House of World Cultures with a video. The Shiving Pasha was doing the videos and we had an all-night performance from sunset to sunrise. And the audience was there all the time and we did it three times. And it was happening the same Friday night. This group was also normally playing in Pizza. So the thing is, we didn't want to break the cycle and not to make it a showpiece. But now, you know, after me, many other people have invited them and they perform like directly, you know, to them yes, on it. And then I think it's a little, you know, I mean, I have second thoughts about that. Right, one second. But were there, um, were there uh, genres of uh, Sufi folk music that you had recorded and come across that you felt could not be translated to the stage and you didn't attempt it? I mean, you cannot, uh, you cannot transport the whole thing. That, yeah, I know, that, it's a context. That, but then you have like classical forms, you know, like Nasiruddin yeah. Sami. That's a music which has been performed in chorus. And it's, you can put it on the stage. I mean, you know, to a degree that makes sense. And these people are also really used to handle stages. Also Rob Fakir or, you know, all the other people. And actually one thing I did, because I knew something, I, I knew Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan and Abda Parveen from many years before. But they had come over to the West and whoever said the word Pakistan and Sufi, Oh, Nusra, so, so I thought, you know, they, these guys, these people, these artists are exposed anyway, you know. So what I want people to see is the whole scene which is hidden behind the broad back of Nusra Fadiya Khan. Because there are so many people uh, who are rather in the shadow. So, I mean, intentionally, I didn't bring any people who were like famous. Some have become famous after that, like uh, the Dolia, uh, Papu Sain, and you know, some people. So, so uh, 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 the, the Shalati Fakir is now, Kurban Fakir is also there, but of course the school is going on. But he was, uh, he was, a <laughs> I should, uh, you know, there's memories more than I can share with you. Well, let's open up the conversation to the audience now. We're in the last 15 minutes, yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how can we revive Sufi heritage as a spiritual? How can we revive Sufi heritage as a, a spiritual spirit of this region? 
Then we have a question. How can we revive Sufi heritage as the uh, spiritual spirit of this region? Spiritual, however, the spirit of this region. <laughs> you see, if you use the word revive, you you think about it as being it's already it's dead, dead. Yeah. and then if you revive it. I don't think it will really work because I think if something is strong, uh, you know, I mean, again, Sufi, and in, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing which goes underground, has been going underground for centuries in places and came up in a new surprising form in other spaces, may not even call itself, I'm a Sufi, but something different. And uh, you know what you have if you're if you like personally interested, you just have to think about reviving your, yourself, <laughs> reviving your soul. Uh, but if you do it as a public, you know, exposing it to the public, that doesn't work. The more you try to expose it, the less is left of it. What do you think was the major catalyst for the outreach of the Sufism? Sorry? What do you think is the major catalyst for the outreach of the popularity of Sufism throughout the world? I'm sorry, I didn't really get that. What was the major catalyst? The major catalyst? For, for the popularity and the outreach of the Sufism throughout the world. Internationally, yes. yes. Globally. Like how is Sufism made? Especially in the popular. areas where there were no shrines, as you mentioned, that basically uh, Sufism was more popular in places where there were a lot of shrines. So, what about those places where there were the absenteeism of uh, shrines and such devotional people over there? So you how? Know, I recently, I did book, we have been at the Sufi festival in Oman, in uh, Muscat, in the opera of Muscat. And a friend of mine programs some the music there. <coughs> and uh, he says, I want to introduce Sufism to the people in Oman. And we have to be very careful because they don't know anything about it. It's the first time usually they listen to pop music <coughs> or to some classical anyway. And so uh, I was there and there were also some Omani scholars and we, there was a conference and I said to them, uh, what about the shrines? Uh, what, 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 what shrines do you have here? And they said, yes, we have fun. And there's Yusuf Ali, and he's up in the mountains, 2,000 kilometers from here. Uh, it's a short time to visit. But that's the only one which is left. All the others we've been, people have been taken down. So, uh, uh, you know, in that case, I think it's a good effort to bring so the, the dwelling dervishes from, yeah. from Turkey were there. And, the Kavali plan from uh, so these people become uh, protagonists in a country which somehow has forgotten about trust. Okay. I think, sorry, I'm also <coughs> going to respond uh, a little to your question as a historian, not a, not a musician. Um, when you talk about the popularity of um, of you know, Sufi culture, Sufi ideas outside of the context in which they're practiced, Yani Garga Ki Bahar. Uh, it started probably with um, the, the discovery of this culture in its poetic form by uh, European scholars, by poets like Goethe, and, um, and, this, and it was romanticized uh, for uh, people outside that tradition. And then in, in the more recent past, you have the internationalization of the music, which really is uh, universally accessible. You know, Sartre Ali Khan was just genuinely uh, so good that people like to listen to it all over the world. And now, of course, you have everybody looking for the soft face of Islam and the tolerant face of Islam. So that has a lot to do with it. <laughs> This whole narration, uh, you know, as, as a historian, I think you have to be careful about that because actually uh, it's not that Goethe and his colleagues were thinking about Hafiz and translating them, that's also coming under the heading, but the cultural context between the Orient and what we call Europe uh, has, been, has been going on for really 
several thousand years. Absolutely. And there was a lot of transmission also with the Greeks, as you know, but also <laughs> like the troubadours were a cultural implant. And that was a major implant. But later, you know, at the time of Goethe, they also romanticized the troubadours. Where these opera, the troubadour is a guy in, 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 in pants and he's dancing around and he's crazy for love and something. But actually, the, the troubadours had a very serious, uh, uh, I, I mean, they had a very particular way of thinking about uh, sexuality and, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 they were all celibates. And, uh, and all this has been left out, you know, at that time, this was the Vietnam War on European soil because these guys were mercenaries which were left over from the Crusades and the Europeans had lost the Crusade, Jerusalem had gone back to Saladin and these guys were in Europe cruising around, they were full of weapons and they didn't know what to do. So the King of France hired them and said, go to that country, south of France, take all what they possess, kill them and uh, so uh, this is the job I give to you so you can pay yourself by looting the people and that's what they did and they, they burned whole cities with 70,000 people just burned to the ground and the, the, the delegate of the Pope was standing on the board and he said uh, no matter there may be some Christians which are killed alongside with these but uh, God knows them and he will take them to heaven when they are there and, and so we don't mind also killing some Christians. You know, so, so history is, uh, I mean, there's, in, in there's a red ring now, right? This gentleman had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Victor. It has been a wonderful talk. Uh, these Sufi music singers and Sufi music, the singers have been, you know, mainly thriving on the Sufi poetry, which was written by all these uh, authors and uh, writers. Like he, Malisha, Bulisha, other love freedom. So, what has been your focus? Have you been focusing on the sound, the vocals, or the poetry? And uh, what is uh, because Sufi music is something to do with Hamad and praising Allah, you know, giving the philosophy of life and um, other aspects that you know those Sufi singers have been. So what has impressed you, the poetry, the sound, or the voice, or is a mixture of everything? See, the, the thing is that when I came here first, I had no idea about the language, but I lived at that time in cemetery, nobody said any English, so I was kind of forced. They taught me like a small child, you know, this is this, sing that song, <laughs> you sing it, repeat it, and so on. So gradually the meaning unveiled itself for me and uh, I was really keen to understand more of that and I even later enrolled into comparative religions to find out what they knew. They knew very little in the seminar except the historical text. But uh, uh, I, I think your question is very much valid. Because, I don't know, I, yesterday there was a book launched on Nusrat Fadi Ali Khan. So, you know, Nusrat Fadi Ali Khan was sort of really very much exposed. And he has a big credit and he was a great artist and so on. But when he first came to Berlin, you know, I, it was like 85 or so. And I interviewed him and because the newspaper said, this is a crossbreed between Cavarotti and Meatloaf and he's doing, and he's doing yes, uh, jazz, sketch and flamenco and whatever all rolled into one. So I went to, up to him and I said, Panda, what's your opinion about Meatloaf and Cavarotti? And he said, what? I never heard of his name. And I said, and what's your flamenco and your sketch and all that? And he said, what are you talking about? I'm singing Gowali, you know? So the thing is, but somehow, people have sort of cut uh, Nusrat Fadi Ali Khan's lyrics to size, and it became the soundtrack of 
natural born killers and uh, the death of Jesus Christ. And in addition to that, you see that it has been totally distorted. So now people say, the sheer power of sound, you know, uh, is what attracts the Westerners and it becomes a message of the Sufis and so on. That's said, I repeat it all the time. But I think, you know, that Nusrat uh, Fatih Ali Khan, minus the lyrics, nothing is left. I mean, <laughs> he's living, he's feeding, he's breathing, he's raised, and he's, you know, nurtured on Sufi poetry. So how can you <coughs> take away the, away the poetry, right? So there is uh, this kind of hype. And I don't think, uh, you know, if you're singing songs, you naturally you, 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 you want your audience to understand what you're singing. I mean, the Sufi poets, they wrote in or sang in Sindhi and Sarai and Punjabi, basically, because the audience was Punjabi or Sarai or Sindhi. So they had to use the language, otherwise they could have sung Arabic or Latin or whatever. So, and now we have a thing that, you know, when we did the Shalatif uh, 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 performance in Berlin, we, we, we had this translate, running translations of the verses, but then again, you know, just the translation of the verses doesn't help you so much because unless you know the story of Omar and Marvi and the 50 versions of it, uh, you cannot really make head and tail of that. So, the cultural context is always like, it's not easy, I mean, but thing is, people have to come and visit each other, and uh, tourism, maybe not the best way, the best way is you go somewhere, you don't know anything about it, and you're there, and people accept you and tell you, stay here, we have to tell you something. You know, that, that I consider myself very lucky, because that's what happened to me. I guess what you're saying that the, that the sound, at least, is a, is a gateway into the experience, which of course is much more complex and holistic. All right, unfortunately, we are out of time. Peter is here. This book is available. Please carry on the conversation outside. Thank you so much, Peter.